Welcome to the USC School of Architecture Fall Lecture Series and the inaugural Dean's Creative Talk uh, Series. I'm Milton Curry, uh, Dean of the School of Architecture here at USC. As an academic cultural institution in South Los Angeles, training the next generation of citizen architects, we're training them to be intelligent designers and creative social thinkers. We also engage citizenry on issues that affect their own environment, community, and well-being. Redefining the agency of the architect to include influencer of public policy and advocate for change, the school looks beyond conventional design education to provide unique cultural experiences for students, faculty, and the greater public. The Dean's Creative Talk series is an opportunity for the school to curate conversations with leading and courageous thinkers on topics that resonate with the mission and values of the school. These conversations are meant to provoke dialogue across disciplinary silos and create a forum for experimental ideas. Our inaugural participant in this series, professor and philosopher Jason Stanley, embodies the spirit of this forum. Since 2013, Jason Stanley has been the Jacob Urofsky Professor of Philosophy at Yale University. Before Yale, he was distinguished professor in the Department of Philosophy at Rutgers University. He has also been a professor at the University of Michigan and Cornell University. He earned his PhD in philosophy at MIT, and he received his BA from the State, of the University, the State University of New York at Stony Brook in 1990. Professor Stanley has published four books, over 40 peer-reviewed papers. He lectures widely and there have been conferences focused solely on his work. His public, scholarly, his public scholarship is exemplary. He has published work in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Boston Review, Chronicle of Higher Education, and has appeared on countless radio and television programs, uh, most recently Morning Joe, I believe, on MSNBC, and also on uh, locally Ian Masters show, radio show here in Los Angeles. How Fascism Works, his current book that was published in September of this year, uh, we're going to get into a little bit later, um, and we're also going to have uh, these books for sale after this talk. Um, How Fascism Works, The Politics of Us and Them, was published by Penguin Random House this year in the primary subject of our discussion today. His fourth book, it's his fourth book and perhaps his most ambitious work. His third book, How Propaganda Works, published by Princeton University Press in 2015, was the winner of the 19, 2016 Prose Award for the subject area of philosophy. His second book, Know How, published in 2011, and uh, no, Knowledge and Practical Interest, published in 2005, and Language and Context, published in 2007. Jason, it's been an extraordinary journey to watch and experience your rise as a preeminent political philosopher the precision of your insights drawn from day laborers and union workers for your book, Know How, to the lessons of your own ancestral heritage that you leverage to address both propaganda and fascism in your latest two books, to the nature of our actual lived democracy at the contemporary moment, and the different delivery systems that you've deployed from academia to the public airwaves is symbolic of the very best attributes of a public intellectual. I look forward to our conversation this evening. Please join me in welcoming Jason Stanley to USC Architecture. It's, it's an honor to be here, and especially watching Dean Curry over the years. We started as faculty members together at Cornell, and I would not be the person I am without his, uh, his modeling of what academia should be. Thank you. Do I get royalties on the four books? Five books, okay, Milton. Five, five books, sorry. <laughs> uh, so Jason and I will be um, in conversation for about 40 minutes, and we'll then open up for questions. Uh, there'll be persons roaming uh, the uh, hallways here with microphones, so please have your questions ready. Uh, there will also be, as I mentioned, a book signing uh, and book selling happening in Watt Hall on the second floor in the lower Rosenden Gallery. Uh, just across the way, immediately following this reception. 
immediately following this conversation, there'll also be a reception where you can speak with Jason uh, more informally at that time as well. Okay, so let's get started. Jason, you've been a philosophy professor for over 25 years. Yeah, don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> what motivated you to turn from analytical philosophy, the primary training that you got at MIT, to political philosophy, uh, work that you're doing now, implementized by the, the two most recent books, How Fascism Works and How Propaganda Works? Uh, Good, good question. First of all, I, I wouldn't describe my work as political philosophy in the analytic vein or the kind of work that is done in political science departments under political theory because uh, top, topics uh, such as propaganda and ideology were kind of set aside in these domains. Uh, political philosophy ends up being the study of you know, which picture of justice do you accept. And, uh, and I find injustice more philosophically puzzling than justice. <laughs> um, the, or f injustice also more important. Um, so, uh, so my work is really rooted in, in work that you helped draw my attention to in critical race theory and feminism, that, uh, but particularly critical race theory, uh, because those are the areas where, where I think you get the sort of weapons to understand uh, uh, the kinds of uh, malformations in society that lead us to where we are. So my work in analytic philosophy is on philosophy of language and epistemology. Uh, and uh, philosophy of language and epistemology, like political philosophy, were kind of structured uh, just to like, <clears throat> I mean, there's a, th there's, a, there's a set of letters between Gershom Scholem and uh, Walter Benjamin, and Gershom Scholem is, is taking courses with a great logician, Gottlob Frege, and writes to Benjamin and says, uh, you know, it's amazing uh, language. You say the dog is on the mat and uh, the cat is on the mat, and people understand, uh, you know, have that there's a cat and it's on a mat, and, you know, and, and Walter Benjamin says, that's not, you know, that's not the interesting fact about language. The interesting fact about language is why, when Adam named the animals, did they spring into being? Uh, so, uh, so I think I started, I started finding analytic philosophy of language limiting in terms of what it was focusing on and explaining in, uh, and what I was seeing in the environment, which was not language used to simply to communicate information, but language used to distort, language used to, to, to sculpt emotion and, and create fear. Um, so, so I started thinking, you know, first of all, I started seeing that like philosophy was making idealizations that were blocking it from being useful and explaining Do you have an what was. So, um, so take conspiracy theories. Like take Pizzagate, for instance. Uh, Pizzagate, does everyone recall Pizzagate? So um, Edgar Madison, so Edgar Madison Welch walks into Comet Pizza. So the, the far right is spreading this, this conspiracy theory about uh, the Hillary Clinton and other Congress, Democratic Congress people have uh, enslaved children for a sex ring in the basement of Comet Pizza. So Edgar Madison Welch goes in and he, he goes to free the enslaved children and shoots up the place. Uh, and as soon as he does that, he's denounced by Alex Jones and others as a stooge for the Democratic Party. So if you believed that there was a, that that was happening, you should go and, and free the children. Clearly conspiracy theories are not functioning just as describing the world. Something else is going on. So if you have a theory of language that just tells you, you know, this is the description of the world that these world words mean, it's missing something very important. So, an, you know, analytic, so departments of philosophy, uh, and we have a, I think, a multidisciplinary audience with mm. us tonight, which is great. But uh, typically, uh, philosophy departments have been split between analytic philosophy and continental philosophy. Um, and so, at this point in time, your work, um, as I understand it, is using the 
um, the strategies of precision from philosophy, and particularly analytic philosophy, That's right. uh, to go at questions that might be stereotypically termed continental philosophical questions, right? So That's right. about race and feminism and identity. These are things that typically sat in the continental philosophy world. And I think most of us in architecture are most familiar with, with philosophers on the continental That's side. That's right. Deleuze Guattari, Bruno Latour on the, on the contemporary side, um, Rawls, Hannah Arendt. Oh, Rawls, Rawls is an Rawls. analytic political yeah. philosopher, right. right. But I think that we're most familiar with, right. with, with things That's we right. can relate to from our discipline in terms right. of getting an intentionality uh, from the point of view of, of real life experience versus the abstraction right. that is more uh, the of, of analytic philosophy. Is there something about um, getting an intentionality and, and, and precision that you got from analytic philosophy that helps you now to tackle these, these questions? Well, when I look to the theorists who I most admire, I mean, I think the two theorists I most admire, I would say, are Noam Chomsky and Angela Davis. And both of those theorists have the clarity of analytic philosophy. Like, if you look at, like, the last chapter of Are Prisons Obsolete? Angela Davis faces the question, uh, says, talking about prison abolition, she says, uh, take a question like, uh, she says, the big obstacle is people ask you, what replaces the prison? And she says, you know, and then she shifts into analytic mode. And she's always in analytic mode. I mean, Angela Davis is a crystal clear writer. There's no BS in Angela Davis. There's no over, I mean, not that, you know, Butler, Judith Butler and, and others write, they, but they, they tend to write in an obscure way, but that's not how Angela Davis writes. When she looks at that question, what, she, what replaces the prison? She says, you have to defeat the presupposition that there must always be something that replaces the prison. There must be a prison-shaped footprint in society. And she says, so you must re-describe the social world so that the question doesn't make sense. So that the presupposition of the question, that there must be a prison-shaped footprint, doesn't make sense. So when I look at like Noam Chomsky, Angela Davis, they're writing in a way that I think is conditioned by the kind of rigor that, uh, that, that you find with, with analytic training. Um, but they're paying attention to structures and, qu and questions that typically you find uh, in the continental tradition. Interesting. So moving now to kind of how fascism works, um, before we get into the 10 tenets of fa tactics or tenets of fascism that you outline in your book that I want you to go through, um, can you identify kind of how the how books, um, of which this is the <laughs> second, <laughs> First of all, how, how many how books are you going to write? But um, how propaganda works um, was also a, a well-received, well-reviewed book that was uh, publicly accessible, um, but written for an academic audience as well. Um, how do these two books fit? How do you want these two books to seem to fit together for readers, both in academia and in the public context? Right. So how propaganda works was an academic work I wrote on the topic of propaganda. The topic of propaganda, when I wrote it, people were saying, that's bizarre, propaganda? I mean, it's not the 1950s. What a weird topic to be talking about. Um, so uh, it came out in May 2015. Uh, and it, it never occurred to me that anyone outside philosophy departments would read it. But it, uh, and it's written in a sort of dry academic style that how fascism works is not. Um, but what happens is reality catches up. Hmm. And, uh, and then people understand the dry academic stuff. They're like, oh, I, ideology, I see how that happens. <laughs> the, uh, so I, I, how fascism works is based on the academic work I did in how propaganda works. Uh, in how propaganda works, I'm trying to lay the structure for how, uh, for, for how an ideology can form. Um, mm -hmm. So earlier when you asked me about, about analytic philosophy, like take epistemology. A, a problem with, with epistemology and analytic philosophy is it looks at knowledge and different theories of knowledge. But from a theory of knowledge, you're not going to get a theory of ignorance. Like, ignorant, <laughs> like ideological ignorance is not just not knowing. Mm -hmm. It's not knowing, and even when stuff is shoved in your face, Ignoring it. <laughs> so how does that work? Right. And you find law. So uh, so you find long discussions of that. Obviously, in the black intellectual tradition, <laughs> feminists and critical race theorists have dealt with uh, with these problems for a long time. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, so Lewis Gordon's uh, Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism uh, being example, recent example. Um, so, so what I was doing in How Propaganda Works is sort of giving the abstract structure of concepts like ideology and how I think of propaganda as a concept. And what I'm doing in How Fascism Works is I'm looking at one particular ideology, one particular structure that has a very particular form. We tend to use fascism to mean, you know, bad things. But fascism is not a catch-all for bad things. It's one particular bad thing. It's one particular deformation. And so this book is about that deformation. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think that, you know, throughout, in, how, in both books, I'm dealing with anti-democratic ideologies. Like, and this connects to the analytic philosophy point, the idealizations that you make in analytic philosophy is you assume that, you know, uh, you look at different versions of society where everyone's basically well-intentioned. When you're thinking about language, you're thinking about conversations where everyone's cooperative and trying to mm -hmm. communicate information. You're not thinking of like the Rwandan, you know, the, the lead up to the Rwandan genocide. And when you're thinking about uh, epistemology, you're just assuming that people see mm -hmm. what's right in front of them. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'm looking at, uh, so here I'm looking at one particular deformation, deformation um, that, that, so the way I set things up and how propaganda works is, is what are these obstacles to this democratic nirvana where we can all understand each other and, mm -hmm. and cooperate and work mm -hmm. together? Mm -hmm. So, um, can you, be, before we get into to how fascism works, um, can you define what you mean by ideology? Um, uh, oh, easily. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a term that's thrown around quite, quite. By fascism, right? Yeah, yeah. casually, so, yeah. So, um, without going into, um, you know, the things that you and I have discussed at multiple conferences together uh, over, um, uh, Professor Dean Curry was at our ideology conference at Yale. Uh, so an ideology is a structure uh, of habits and practices and concepts uh, that, uh, that structure the way you think. So sometimes people think of ideologies just as a set of beliefs. Uh, I think that's, that's unhelpful. It's also unhelpful when you're thinking about fascism um, because fascism you know, people often ask me, do you think the leaders you talk about really believe the awful things they say? And I want to say, it doesn't matter because fascism is a set of practices to seize and maintain power. Mm -hmm. And so ideology is best thought of, I think, as a set of practices or concepts that structure, um, that, that structure the way you move around in, in the world. And ideology can be a path you take you know, from the subway to your house. Uh, architecture create, the architecture of a city creates an ideology. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I remember I lived in Harlem for many years and one time, and I always take a path, like the gentrifier path from the subway <laughs> to my apartment. And one time I went on a different path and I spat on the side of the road and someone said to me, are you kidding? You're gonna get like a huge fine for that. I'm like, you can't get a fine for spitting. Well, it turns out, if you walk on those streets, mm. on that path home, <laughs> you can because it's hyper over policed. And, sure. you know, so an ideology can be as simple as, as you know, the path you take from the subway. You guys don't know what subways are, but you, you should. We actually do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, from subway, to, from the subway. We to do, home. we do. Okay. <laughs> so an ideology is, 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 is uh, a set of practices, it can be structured by, uh, uh, I mean, it can be structured by a physical space, uh, a set of concepts, uh, a, uh, you know, an ideology that contains uh, a concept like heretic <laughs> is, is, uh, is a very particular ideology, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, apostle. Okay. So what is fascism and what are the tactics of fascism? So, my book is about fascist politics and fascist ideology. It isn't about fascist governance. I think, you know, people are asked ask me, you know, do, well, does Poland have a fascist government now? Does Hungary have a fascist government? Does, fill in the blank, 
have a fascist government, <laughs> or uh, I've been instructed to not fill in that. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so the, uh, so, and 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 that's not my goal. My goal is to describe fascist ideology and tactics using core examples, um, uh, like oh, I always return to to Hitler, uh, for obvious reasons. Well, that's a very extreme example, um, but. So I break it into 10, uh, ten uh, sort of aspects. I think one way of sort of simplifying things is to, is, is to think, like I've been talking about ignorance, I've been talking about language as a way to sort of confuse and obfuscate rather than clarify. So that's a way of thinking of what's going on, is that at the basis of fascism is an attack on truth. Fascism is about power. So fascism is about power, loyalty, and fear of the other. Uh, so uh, Plato's Republic has this figure, Thrasymachus, who's, uh, who, whose uh, ideology is just power, and Plato is trying to respond to him to describe a world in which truth is respected. So all of these tactics are ways to destabilize, to, to undermine a culture that respects truth and replace it by one whose only value is power. So, so the first chapter is called the mythic past. So fascism harkens back to a mythic past where the 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 <laughs> chosen nation members of the chosen nation got respect just because they were members of the chosen nation. It's harshly patriarchal. Men were men. Women stayed at home, raised children. Chapter two. So that's a tax truth because that past never existed. Mm -hmm. uh, chapter two is called propaganda. Uh, fascist. Fascist, fascist propaganda inverts everything. Fascists always call their opponents fascists. Uh, it's very, you know, uh, Putin would call Angela Merkel and Obama fascists, which is bizarre. Um, so uh, so the, the mainstream press is the lying press, the Lugenpresse. Uh, everything is a, oh, fascists always run anti-corruption campaigns, even though they're often very corrupt. So you could imagine so a fascist candidate, like you might ask, how could a candidate run against, say, Hillary Clinton, promising to drain the swamp if a candidate did that? Um, they, uh, you know, uh, but you have throughout, you know, Putin in 2011, I mean, I'm sure Putin is a nice guy, um, but Putin ran an anti-corruption campaign in 2011. <laughs> By some measures, he's the wealthiest man on earth. So corrupt politicians run anti-corruption campaigns. Everything is its opposite. Um, uh, chapter three is called anti-intellectualism. You attack the truth. You attack universities for uh, you attack universities, the media, and expertise. Um, the idea that you try to promote is there's just is there's just one perspective, the dominant perspective, and and institutions that try to describe a more complex and nuanced version of reality, uh, like universities with multiple perspectives are in fact, uh, you attack them as sort of undermining the dominant narrative. Chapter four, unreality. Um, you try to destabilize people's sense that there's a, uh, that there's a sort of a common uh, referee for debate and discussion. Conspiracy theories are the classic tactic to do that. Uh, so uh, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the uh, National Socialist said, the mainstream media is owned, controlled by the Jews. How do you know that? Because they don't report that they're owned by the Jews. <laughs> and that's how it always works. So birtherism, um, uh, which I think originated in Russia, but there was a political candidate who came to power, who came to politics, Donald Trump came to politics um, with birtherism. And there's an interview with him that I discuss in the book on Fox News where he says CNN is controlled by Obama, you could tell because CNN won't discuss the fact that Obama is born in Kenya. So that's classic uh, conspiracy theory. Uh, the Russian political technologists, I think, have discovered a new way, RT, like an art, just have every possible view discussed. That's what's going on in part when that people are like, yeah, we should everything discussed. If you discuss things in the mainstream media, you give them extra credence that they shouldn't have. So RT discusses everything. Like you have perfectly sensible people on RT, and then you have Nazis on RT. And it's like, it's all 
put there for you and you mm -hmm. can decide. Mm -hmm. And what happens is people are just bewildered and they don't know what's true. Chapter five is called, this fifth tactic is hierarchy. Liberal democracy prizes equality. Uh, uh, equa uh, fascism replaces that by hierarchy. Fascists always say nature demands a hierarchy. Equality is a myth. Uh, so you know, it's just a fact of nature that some groups are better than others and we have to face this fact. Uh, we have to be brave and face this fact. Uh, so hierarchy is one, and that's an, another way to displace the truth because the fact is that we all suck in roughly equivalent degrees. So when you try to <laughs> replace equality with an ethic of hierarchy, you're destabilizing truth. The sixth tactic is victimhood. So in fascist moments, the dominant group is always the victim of minority groups. Uh, the dominant group is always the, uh, you know, Victor Orban in his October 12, 2017 speech uh, in, in the International uh, Conference of the Persecution of Christians in Budapest said, Christians are the most persecuted group in, in the world right now. Um, uh, I think a little bit of an exaggeration. Uh, and uh, so the dominant group is always the victims of, of uh, the men's rights movement, you know, uh, of, in, 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 of equality. Uh, uh, the minority groups, how are the minority groups victimizing uh, the majority? Well, they're criminals. The Jews were criminals. Uh, the, you know, you, you, the, 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 the out group, you raise hysterical fear about the out group. Fascism is a politics of emotion and, and the emotions are, it, it tries to create overwhelming fear, disgust, and nostalgia. Disgust at mixing of the chosen group with the out group. So the first kinds of laws fascists, fascists push for are often you know, illegalizing relations between the out group and the in group. Uh, Anti-miscegenation laws, the Nuremberg laws. Uh, so law and order politics. All fascist campaigns are law and order politics. Are law. The fascist Bolsonaro in Brazil is running a law and order campaign, calling for extrajudicial killings and vigilantism. Uh, uh, the eighth. Um, well, you could. I could just ask you, what crime does the out group do, from which we need to be We need to be protected. Anyone? Existing. Well, existing rape is the crime. Yeah. So everywhere it's rape. And there's something interesting here because like if you look at Myanmar, uh, the Rohingya, what, in 2012, three Rohingya men raped a ranking woman. And all the Rohingya were then put in, in 200 villages, consigned to 200 villages. And horrific propaganda was directed against them. And then they were attacked and mass rape was committed against them. But no one talks about that. They're like, oh, in, in, in Myanmar, it's the, it's the Rohingya who are rapists. Because rape is only a crime that you can perpetrate on the in-group women. Mm. Then, uh, so sexual anxiety. You, know, you raise sexual anxiety and you make in-group men feel that they can't protect their women and children. And they need a strong leader to protect them. So, uh, so the out-group, the, 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 you raise fear about rape from, from out-group out men. Um, this chapter nine is called Sodom and Gomorrah. The, uh, the, you know, in Europe, the Jews lived in cities. Chapter two of Mein Kampf is called My Time in Vienna. And Hitler says, you know, I go to Vienna and it's just Jews, Jews, and more Jews. So the, the out group lives in the cities where, where there are homosexuals and mixing of different groups of the out group and the in group. And hey, in the United States, the expression inner city means mm -hmm. a certain thing. Mm -hmm. And then the final chapter is called Arbeit macht frei, work shall make you free. This is what was at the, and it's about social Darwinism. The out group are always lazy. The Jew, the reason that the concentrate in Auschwitz had work shall make you free written on it was because the out group, Jews, were supposed to be lazy. They were lazy criminals. And you had to make them work for free to give them a work ethic. So the idea is the out group needs to be made to work for free and that and that's a gift to them because it's making them free it's giving them a work ethic that's a lot to yeah to, to digest uh and to absorb but we're but we're, I hope it we're doing familiar. it <laughs> um so you know some ask what do we you know what is what is 
in architecture school uh, doing, uh, sponsoring this talk and kind of having a discussion about fascism. Um, architecture of the exactly. Of the yeah, they have nothing to do with each other. Um, so some of the some of the examples that that would be more, most familiar to to architects would be the work of Albert Speer, of course, Adolf Hitler's architect and later minister, um, who produced stunning monumental works that um, are complicated, obviously, by that embroiled history um, with with Hitler. Um, additionally, uh, Giuseppe Terrani. Um, in Italy, Italian architect designed the Casa del Fascio in Como, which uh, was designed and saved under the regime of, of Mussolini. Um, but there's also, I think, other instances where architecture has had the patronage of autocratic leadership. Right? I'm thinking of uh, Kubitschek in Brazil mm. and the building of Brasilia, which um, he was maybe an autocratic leader. I'm not sure if you would consider him a, a fascist leader. Mm -hmm. But um, certainly the labor that it took to build um, Latin American you know, cities, uh, modernism uh, at the scale of Brasilia was something that, that involved um, some of the tactics that you're talking about in some ways. So I'm wondering, um, have you thought about um, the ways in which architecture, the infrastructure of how people live and work is imbricated in some of these tactics and how these tactics get deployed. Yeah, so this gets back to your question of what an ideology right. is, right? Right. Because an ideology is, is I mean, if you think about like our, uh, the structure of, of many cities before the Americans with Disabilities Act, that's an ideology of ableism because it sort of structures the space to privilege one group. So your physical space structures things to uh, to create an ideology. So how does fascist architecture work to create a fascist way of thinking in the people who, who move through those spaces? But I think so like, there's a monumentality right. point. The, if you think of the Berlin Olympiastadion, the sort of, uh, you know, the place where the Führer sits, the sort of like, the places that, that, you know, the masses are sort of like one big sort of amorphous uh, group or, or the Nuremberg rally space where you can fit uh, or where Milosevic or the Kosovo battlefield where Milosevic spoke to a million people, you know, where you have this huge group and you have one place for a leader to stand. And so that's the kind of way that you can structure things so, so people feel that they're, you know, Klemper talks about fascist and fascist propaganda working to blur everyone into just one faceless mask mass to move forward to support the nation and the leader. Right, but we think about, I mean, I think like, not unlike how uh, fascism is used casually to describe mm -hmm. bad things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, there's broad brushes to paint in terms of, you know, anything monumental and, wow. and you know, calling for masses, you know, the Los Angeles Coliseum is fascist because... <laughs> I avoid <laughs> Um, so, so obviously, I mean, that's, that's, you know, these are obviously there's, there's inside politics here, but then there's kind of the perception and the kind of the notion of actually what architecture, uh, what its articulation is to a public facing audience. And so there's obviously a lot of nuances there. Um, I want to go back to 1968 because well, that, yeah. I, I, think, I think what's important to think about is not what fascist architecture is, but what democratic architecture is. Sure, absolutely. So the flip side. So I guess going back to 1968 for a moment and saying um, that was a moment where particularly um, on the aesthetic end of things, um, propaganda was used quite effectively by, you think of the French activists, the posters that were produced during, you know, for that uh, campaign. You think of the uh, Mexico City Olympics in 1968, the activists kind of cleverly turning the brilliant uh, graphic campaign for the Olympics into a series of protest posters that that actually used um, a very nuanced kind of kind of graphic interface to 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 resist right to form a resistance, and then the um, you know the Black Panthers, the work of someone like Emory Douglas in the United States, tremendous kind of cartoon linked with kind of a Lichtensteinian voice aesthetically to propagate um, you know a propaganda about certain issues related to. The black experience in the U.S. So, just I can't, to I can't help but yeah, I saw John Carlos 
in conversation with Emory Douglas oh, wow. at yeah. Yale. Uh, yeah. they, they, this remarkable thing that our students put up, game versus game. Game recognizes game. Uh, like how black yeah. artists and black right. sport uh, athletes used their venues to make political statements. Right, so in that sense, aesthetics is used for arguably right. um, to try to attain a more democratic uh, space, voice, experience. So are the tactics that you're talking about in fascism, how fascism works, such as propaganda and unreality, is it legitimate for those to be used by someone who's trying to open up a, a new democratic space? That's a great question. And we face it, we face it, we face one version of that question with the whole, when they go low, we go high versus when they go low, we take their knees out or whatever. <laughs> um, so, but but I don't think that propaganda. I mean, I my 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 friends in the east. I mean, I think one problem uh, with using these tactics. I don't think these tactics should be used by for a good purpose. For I don't think these tactics are neutral because they right. wear down the democratic culture that you need in order for to affect positive social change. And what was happening with the civil rights movement, what John Carlos and Tommy Smith did and Peter Norman in their protest in Mexico City was not to wear down truth. They weren't lying. They were actually trying to use the moment to reveal something true. I mean, mm -hmm. like Du Bois, I'm corny about the truth. Du Bois capitalizes truth in Black Reconstruction. And, uh, and uh, you know, the propaganda sort of using art to disclose a more complex, nuanced reality, well, uh, that, that is the opposite of fascist propaganda. Because in fascist propaganda, what you're trying to do is you're trying to like shut down the more complex, nuanced reality and replace it with some simple, dominant vision or of pure, pure emotion like fear. If you think about like a play like Shuffle Along, mm -hmm. like what Shuffle Along does is it draws white audiences in with a stereotype. You're going to see black Americans, you know, uh, shuffling and jiving or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then it shows you a more complex reality underlying that. I think Donald Glover is mm -hmm. doing the same thing in his, uh, well, Gl Glover, the, uh, uh, um, that uh, America video is something similar is happening right. there. So that kind, that's propaganda, but it's propaganda in the service of, of revealing a more complex and variegated reality. Fascists, these tactics eliminate reality and try to replace it with something else. Right, so I think we're gonna open up for questions shortly, so please be ready. But I, I think that um, we both, oh, okay. We both uh, <clears throat> are in disciplines where um, there's a rigidity relative to the questions of, in your discipline, what is philosophy? Uh, we have the question, what is architecture? Right. Architecture can't solve social problems, so what are, you, what are you doing trying to fix something that policymakers or mayors or economists should be fixing? Is that something that's, that's said in your discipline, yes. that architecture can't solve social problems? Yes. I thought architecture was a discipline. That, so. <laughs> and maybe it can't. Um, I think, you know, I think it's right. an open, but, but I guess my question is, uh, from a disciplinary perspective, the precision that's being used to theorize fascism from the point of view of, of your identity as a philosopher, um, we think about the idea of, of, you know, as you said, operatively trying to open up a more democratic space. I think that, um, you know, we look at the work of, you know, Isle Weitzman, for example, who's an architect and theorist who's using kind of the term forensic architecture to use the tools of visual, analytical, diagramming, and speculative uh, tools in architecture to um, open up, um, you know, analysis of spaces of oppression, occupation, uh, et cetera. That's an example of the forensic role, the analytical role of architecture, but I think um, in each project that, that one does, whether it's academia or in practice, that tool, um, that aspect of our work, that uncovering of the problem statement of, you know, here's a problem statement to do a prison. Um, in, the pro in the project statement or problem statement, there's a list of 
solitary There's confinement cell and, <laughs> and the, the rec room and, and right. in, embedded within that are ideologies right. about behavior, et cetera. And I think um, you know, we often overlook that and say, well, this is the brief or this is, you know, I often, often ask uh, students in my seminars that I taught, would you design a, a, a prison if it included solitary confinement cells? Mm -hmm. Um, that's an ethical question, it's a moral question, but it's also... But I think what, I yeah. think what you're raising is that each of our disciplines packs within them, uh, in the very constraints of the discipline, there are ideological presuppositions that are presented as neutral. Like, right. here's just a practical problem. Build a right. prison, here are solitary. Right. You know, there right. are the ideological, and, the, and these, uh, in my discipline, the separation of political philosophy from epistemology, for instance, is an ideological presupposition. The assumption that there's ethics and political philosophy over here, and epistemology, the study of knowledge, well, that's apolitical, and that's over there. Right. As if, you know, like studied ignorance is not a political <laughs> problem. Right. <laughs> you know, so, and that, that makes racism as a philosophical problem invisible, right? Yeah. Because, you know, racism is an epistemological problem. It's a problem of seeing other human beings who are just like you in the right way. Yeah. Um, and you, so, mm -hmm. uh, so, so our disciplines, just in the way they're structured, and I think our multi-decade conversation has been an exercise in breaking down some of these, you always question the assumptions of my discipline. You've always asked me to see spaces philosophically. Um, and uh, I probably haven't done much for you. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, there's still but, time left. But the, 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 the thing is, is that, that the world's problems do not come subscripted with departments to send to. I mean, it would be great if there were problems like, you know, build, construct a neighborhood, construct a building in which people, a school, uh, send this just to the architecture school. Uh, you know, uh, figure out how to run a society, send this just to political science. Or philosophy, but it doesn't work like that. Like you cannot address the problem of how to run a society without asking yourself what the spaces in the society are going to look like, and uh, and and you cannot address the question of what spaces look like without asking like how do you want the people to interact with each other. Uh, so right. Well, th yeah. there is a way that you did help me. Um, okay. And <laughs> I'll end. I'll end uh, with this for now, and then we'll open up for questions and continue. But I think that. Um, when I was at University of Michigan and uh, began to work with Elizabeth Anderson, uh, who writes on egalitarianism, and Derek Darby, who writes on right. racial egalitarianism, and uh, Peter Railton, um, one of the uh, one of the illuminating illuminating conversations uh, was about John Rawls, right. and it was about um, the notion that, um, for those who've read Rawls, that the notion of egalitarianism. Um, that we think of as a, as a progressive view, very democratic, very inclusive, um, but actually there's a limit condition to Rawls's notion of egalitarianism, which is at the point that it runs up against my individual rights, then I can just claim that um, that's the limit of that particular form of egalitarianism, and therefore, um, if, if you, you can't, can't pull, pull yourself, yourself up, up by your bootstraps after this threshold of egalitarian right. gifts that have been given, right. then the state has no obligation to you. And I think that that's where uh, the philosophical work of Elizabeth Anderson and others picks up and says, well, we need a new conception of egalitarianism which goes beyond and, and exceeds a threshold of the argument of individual rights trumps um, the, the social compact. Yes, but it's part yeah. of the the Elizabeth Anderson is a Rawls student, and like all Rawls students, she claims that whatever her view is was actually Rawls. Yes. So just yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, you guys are blissfully, blessedly free of the obligation of fitting your views into those of your professors. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think in, in that example, I think that um, when you when we look at um, take let's take the inner city of which we're sitting in South LA, right. formerly South Central. And um, I think that when we look at the notion of inner cities, um, the overlay of issues of redlining, of uh, zoning, of public policy, environmental racism, right. um, I think a lot of the response is uh, a lot of it's out of our hands. But 
I think when you think about just, I like the, the example you gave of walking, you know, being a flaneur in Harlem as an example of walking and living an ideology. Yeah. I think that similarly when we think about the paths out of or the access out of or to a more democratic, more yeah. accessible space, um, you know, the, the, the social science and stuff that, that we see coming out now about neighborhoods and how the four block radius within zero to five years of age is determinant of incredible social outcomes. And that relates to Elizabeth Anderson's work that you were alluding to. I mean, this is your point that she thinks that egalitarianism requires, you know, uh, second personal seeing each other and relating to each other as fellow human beings with equal exactly. dignity. Yeah. And that involves not being separated. Right in the right. way that redlining does. And it involves interacting right. one, with one another regularly as yeah. equals. Right, but I think imbricating, you know, existing urban conditions to lift up that notion of mutual recognition is itself a corrective for how the city yes. works against that in its very uh, ethos in terms of how, you know, what, what the residual of 50s, 60s, 40s right. planning and urbanism has left us. Right. On that note, um, questions? Yes. There's a microphone coming. Okay. I can just speak up. Okay. So, uh, but you'll, this is being recorded. Guys, yeah. <laughs> Unless you have a really booming voice. So, so um, are you, is this on or? No. <laughs> but it looks good. It's on. <laughs> now it's on. Now it's on. So to, so to return to Benjamin, who uh, in the work of our age of technological reproducibility uh, suggests that um, the aestheticization of politics leads to fascism, which I right. think the way that politics now has become yeah. entertainment is especially prescient. But he offers an antidote that the sort of politicization of aesthetics can sort of challenge that. And so um, my question emerges uh, both in, uh, in architecture, where aesthetics have kind of been obfuscated from its role through sort of distanciation that uh, critiques of architecture come from this judgment that is architectural, not aesthetic. Even though fundamentally that judgment is based on a certain sense of agreeability that is based in aesthetic judgment. And especially now with uh, precedents that we look to who uh, are uh, like explicitly apolitical in their eagerness to sort of co uh, court benevolent dictatorships uh, for sort of commissions, and um, that architecture, the sort of global neo-capitalist architecture, might even in a certain way be a new authoritarian architecture. Um, like I, my question goes to how can we sort of reincorporate politics into architecture in the sort of current sort of uh, dispersed stalemate that I think is the sort of contemporary discourse now in architecture. I'm interested in the philosophical perspective well, first. The, uh, <laughs> So the question raises, uh, a, well, there's a number of issues here. One is this notion of apolitical, which, of course, you know, is itself political. Uh, so, uh, so what is it to, uh, to present something as apolitical? Uh, the, uh, you know, um, I, I don't think there is such a thing as apolitical. I think any kind of structure, the notion of apolitical is highly political. Um, so... Uh, so, uh, you know, there's, it's not clear what neutral would mean, for instance. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, I, 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 so I'm, I'm wondering what, when you talk about architecture being produced, um, you might be talking about, you know, similarly, is there even any notion of mere functionality? Uh, I mean, given what we were talking about with with spaces being ideological. I mean, uh, you might create a, a, a building that would force people to maximize their efficiency in work or something like that. And that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna be political. <laughs> that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna be, uh, and it's, it's gonna fit into, and then you offer it, uh, and it could fit into any number of ideologies, but it wouldn't be democratic because it wouldn't, bring people together, and Rousseau in the social contract says, you know, it's, it's not, it can't be a democracy unless people are regularly interacting with each other. <laughs> so, um, so about the, 
spectacle point. Um, it's a theme you find throughout the literature on fascism. So not just in that early Benjamin article, but Arendt talk because in sm if you want to smash truth, uh, what Arendt's description of fascist politics, uh, it's spectacle. I mean, that's sort of why Dorner writes the culture industry. It's like, you know, there's no truth, it's all just a show. And so, uh, you know, uh, because truth, you, you want to eliminate truth. And when it's just a show, the person with the biggest lights and the best show wins. And so, uh, Arendt also talks about how people get addicted to this excitement. I mean, I've been noticing that fascist, people who use fascist tactics always way overperform at the polls. So Bolsonaro is way better in Brazil than the polls suggested. And I think when people get in the polling booth, it's because even if they didn't think they were going to vote for the guy beforehand, they end up voting for them. It's like, what's going to happen? It'll be kind of cool. <laughs> It'll be wild. <laughs> because of the spectacle thing. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, so I want to take the last part of your question, which is how, how to bring a consciousness, a political consciousness to your work. Um, I think it starts with looking at the brief in front of you, which is the brief in school. It's the project statement. Um, in practice, it's, it's, the, it's the brief of the program. And asking really simple question, what are the structural ideological issues embedded within this? What are the assumptions? Let me just jotting down what you think those assumptions are. Let that be the beginning of a conversation with yourself, with the project, and with your instructor or with the client um, about those presuppositions. I think that's where it starts. A, a cognition and a consciousness about the presuppositions. Some of those may, I mean, they may be good, bad, whatever, but I think um, being more conscious of the presuppositions before actually tackling the brief, I think, um, can start to build that consciousness into the way that you approach the problem. And maybe you can challenge the presuppositions. That too, but you've got to, you know, you got to kind of meditate on them. I think prior to. But, yeah. Microphone. Well, this is kind of cool. Um, I always thought of Disneyland as a land of entertainment, really being sort of a fascist place. Everything is completely planned out. You have to go certain ways. You sit in the car. You are according to your description, Disneyland would be fascist. Hold on. I've actually read a critique about the description of Disneyland as fascist. Los Angeles as a city really is a city of fantasy. There's Disneyland, there's Universal, there's you know, the modernist sort of ideals. You've got other, you've got all, every, there's so many different views of Los Angeles that are really a myth, that are made up. We are a made up city. So is an ant, the question I have for you, would an antidote for fascism be a conglomeration of many, many different myths all working together to create something new? Um, okay, Does that so, make sense? Uh, yeah. Um, I just want to detach, it does make sense. Um, I just wanted to, I, I want to be clear that, um, so I think there's, uh, there's authoritarianism. Authoritarianism is a broad uh, spectrum of which there are different instances. There are different species of authoritarianism. Fascism is one species of authoritarianism, but uh, Authoritarian communism is another species that's not fascism. And it's rhetorically very different from fascism. Fascism theorizes a mythic patriarchal past. Authoritarian communism theorizes a utopian future, a, a utopian, fully egalitarian future. Both are authoritarian, both extinguish truth. So, both are mythic. Both involve myths, but very different myths. So, uh, so Hannah Arendt and Origins of Totalitarianism is trying to theorize them together. As a result, Hannah Arendt never talks about patriarchy anywhere 
in Origins of Totalitarianism. But you cannot talk about fascism without talking about authoritarianism, without talking about patriarchy. As I explained fascism to my three-year-old, in fascism, there's one big daddy. Um, <laughs> fascist politics involves a macho guy who's striding around, and he wins, and he beats everyone. Now, it's true that Stalin did play that role to some extent, but there's communist authoritarianism that doesn't work rhetorically like that at all. It's still authoritarianism. So not, a thought, not all planned, forced authoritarian structures are fascist. For example, um, Timothy, my colleague Timothy Snyder, the great scholar of Eastern Europe, says you know, communist dictatorships involve many more secret agents around you than fascism. <laughs> and she's like, you know, uh, the, the, it, uh, the, there are these differences between authoritarian, so when, when you, between authoritarian structures. I think if we don't pay attention to those differences, then we don't know what kind of authoritarianism we face. Um, so so I, I would say that, you know, it's like the full surveillance state of parts of China is not fascism. It's, but it's a frightening kind of communist authoritarianism. But it's structurally very different. There's not like straightforward, like macho patriarchy, one single leader. Um, so when you talk about Los Angeles, you're talking about it, uh, any kind of authoritarianism is an attack on truth. It's an attempt to sort of like force your way of thinking and living into an ideology where you can't be confronted with different, like your point about different ways of living. You don't have different ways of living being available to you. And that's what democracy is about, is different ways of living in different paths. But, uh, but there are different kinds of ways to limit people's freedom. One is fascism, which is a very particular structure I, I discussed. There's an outgroup, it's us versus them, where they are a different ethnicity, a different religion. Uh, communism is not like that. Unfortunately, this isn't going to be exactly. Is this on? Yeah, yeah, it's on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> okay. Um, it's not actually going to be a question. I want to sort of respond to the issue about architecture, with the example of the Casa del Fascio above, which mm. is by uh, Giuseppe Terani. And the point here is that um, what the fascists did in Italy was take the model of the medieval town hall mm -hmm. and transform it initially and in many buildings um, using almost the identical language with the identical forms, the, pl the balcony for the leader to come and speak to the people, the large meeting hall for discussions among the select to take place to decide policy, um, a series of other things. Terani did the exact same thing at the Casa del Fascio, but he did it in a modern language. And the, but the intentions were identical and they were a reflection of and an implementation of fascist ideology within the architecture itself, within the organization of the architecture. However, um, to call something fascist architecture is tricky because I see it as, loca as, as specific to a place and a time. Mm -hmm. um, that particular architecture in that place had these ambitions and goals mm -hmm. and then it right. becomes. And in another place, you can use the same language and many of the same things, and yet its, its intentions are very different. So I'm reluctant to make the big judgments, but, um, but on a smaller level, then, and you can uh, trace and identify this, and it's exactly what happened in fascist Italy. So that's why uh, uh, the- That's a brilliant point, because ideologies, you can't just take some, an ideology is a collection of practices and concepts, and so you can't just take like a, a, a building out of a whole ideology and be like, this building for in, in any, if you drop it in any other uh, set of practices and habits will have the same function. It, it functions, your point is, it fun, it's gonna, the whole system is going to be fascism. And so you're gonna have to look at how people behave and interact with each other and how that building relates to that way. Exactly. But also, is there, is there something, I think, thanks for that point, I think also, you know, a struggle, a theoretical debate that I think is, is fervent uh, with our discipline as well is, is there something within the ideology of 
modernism itself that has the ability to undercut the, the monolithic deployment of program in this way, right? Is there something, you know, I'm not saying there is or isn't, but I'm saying is there something about Albert Speer's work because of the genre, because of the deployment of the type of architecture, it doesn't allow it internally to undercut its usage for certain things. Is there something within modernist ideology um, that can or, you know, that, that can undercut in a way the permanent usage of it mm. for X, Y, and Z? That's, a, I think, a, a theoretical debate right. um, about analyzing and thinking about works, right. you know, of architecture. Yeah. But, well, uh, yeah, yeah, thing? absolutely. Since, since yeah. I yeah. Have the microphone, so I get to keep it for a second. Um, in, in many respects, much of modernism, much of modernist architecture, arguably was fascist in intent because it right. really yeah. did control um, deliberately and, and quite uh, massively how people were meant to live on a day-to-day -day basis, and both within their individual units and within the community as a whole. Um, it was very much masterminded from above. Now, arguably, will you call this fascist? Well, it depends on where it is and what's going on and who's doing it. But there's, but what you can say about it is that it is profoundly controlling, profoundly, arguably patriarchal in its, in its um, dimensions of organization and space, and also for women, what they're meant to do in the home. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to respond to this yeah. real quick. And then we've got... About a month ago, I... Oh, thank you. About a month ago, I went to a lecture by Professor Stephen Symes, I believe his name is, from University of Notre Dame, who talked about aesthetics and fascism. So I was very interested in coming to this lecture to see what it would be about. And one of the things that he showed were fascist buildings in Italy that were classes, kind of a stripped down classicism, and compared them to work that was being done in the United States that were wholly democratic. And they looked exactly the same. That's your point about different. Right. Uh, sure. That's all I need to well, say. Well, what, what decades sure. were the buildings in the United States? 30s. No, no, no. 30s. Well, the third, but the 30s was an incredibly no, no, fascist back to, time. I'm sorry, in the back to States. West. I'm very sorry, there's somebody else who wants to speak, but in answer to that, I mean, I know Stephen, and I know the lecture that he gave, and I know what he's raising, and the point is, um, and I wrote a dissertation comparing fascist architecture and New Deal architecture, so, um, um, it really does depend upon the place, the intentions, right. a whole series of other things, even though they look the same, so I'm though, sorry, the third, though I'd like to know, the 30s was a time when the United States was almost fascist. I mean, so, I mean, fascist movements gained incredible popularity. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Uh, is this working? Yep. Yeah, there's a proximity issue here. Um, I would love for the students here in the audience for you to circle back around and in a, in a more explicit way, try to uh, give us a more uh, uh, precise description of what would constitute, say, in contrast to the fascist uh, architecture, the democratic architecture. Because what I think is confusing here, uh, which is often the case in discussions of architecture, is uh, the extent to which what we're talking about is really issues of, um, as uh, Milton puts it, brief, the program, the assumptions built into the uh, uh, architectural proposition as a physical entity or a physical artifact that's going to be organizing people and space and the aesthetic dimensions of it, which is what does that look like uh, and the relationship between those two. Because I think that we often get confused in uh, uh, talking about these issues and confusing the two, and which the previous discussion was, a, of course, a perfect example of. So I think it would be super helpful if you could boil it down again to, you know, I don't want to call it a definition or anything like that, but something that we could argue about that said, you know, democratic architecture is about architecture that brings people together in a visible way so that they all see each other being together and, you know, they're on equal terms or whatever. And I, you know, I'm not trying to say what it is. I'm, I'm suggesting what something like that could sound like. 
And then we could begin to question, in view of that, what the uh, visual terms of that might be, because we're not used to thinking about the effect of, uh, you know, we, we often distinguish between form and function and don't uh, recognize that form has a function as well, right. which I think would be absolutely a part of whatever discussion of democratic architecture yeah. you might have that was more, you know, I don't want to say prescriptive, but something that, that you could work with and you could take to the desk to the students and begin a conversation over uh, so that, you know, everybody's sort of talking about the same thing at that point. Well, I, I mean, I think there's sort of a structural way of, uh, I mean, not to be, I mean, I'm going to be very simplistic here, but the idea of a raised, you know, the balcony where the leader is speaking to the masses, a structure like that, which has one sort of point of leadership, a uh, sort of like a highlighted structure where there's sort of a faceless group uh, 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 area is not democratic because it, it creates this that expectation that there's a location for a, uh, a dean's office, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, if we look at the image behind you, we've got you know, Casa del Fascio, we've got a whole bunch of those, uh, where a bunch of different people could be out on the balconies talking to maybe a bunch of other people. You yeah. mentioned the undifferentiated masses or the amorphous masses. Yes. So that immediately suggests to me the formal possibility of uh, the, because the distinction you made was the amorphous mass of people being addressed by a single individual, of, you know, you know. But raised. that's such one idea. Another point gets back to the point that this uh, person, I don't know your name, uh, she's looking at her phone oh, right now, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, if you think, I mean, there's different visions of democratic societies. One is sort of the Rousseauian general will, but a more uh, a sort of more democratic vision would be a democratic society is one that uh, allows for lots of different paths. So a democratic structure wouldn't, would, would allow a kind of chaos of paths. That's what you were indicating. A kind of, uh, it wouldn't constrain to a common way of going. It would allow a kind of anarchy and free flowingness um, of paths through the structure. So people could choose their own paths. I think there are three, let me, let me just, I think there are three dimensions potentially to kind of, that would kind of activate an answer to, to the question. One is the, um, I think you pointed to it, the, the kind of false idealization of democracy and meritocracy and realizing that, um, you know, I think new urbanism, quite frankly, did a fabulous job within our discipline of creating a mythic idealization that was very past driven, um, galvanizing um, folks around that vision and then implementing it through very pragmatic, very practical means. I think that, um, I think that idealizing something that we know is not attainable, right? I think the idea of a walkable community where you've got environmental racism and the air quality is horrible, what does that mean, right? So I think, I think stripping away the kind of mythic notions of idealization, whether it be neighborhood, function of a building, you know, et cetera. Um, prisons are gonna be, you know, rehabilitation centers, but most of them are not, right? So I think stripping away the mythic idealization. Secondly, I think going with Anderson's formulation, Elizabeth Anderson, flattening social hierarchies. Of when you flatten social hierarchies, then we become more equal doesn't mean that, that, that suddenly um, I have as much money as you know, Warren Buffett or, but if we flatten the social heart, that as social beings, as citizens, I have a vote, Warren Buffett has a vote. You know what I mean? So the, the idea of flattening in the social realm, not necessarily saying that that means that everybody gets the same amount of money and everybody gets the same. Nobody gets know. a dean's office. No one gets yeah. a dean's office. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll happily vacate. <laughs> that for something else. But my point is that flattening social hierarchies, I think these are, I think we could talk about kind of in different ways in cities, rural areas, different programs, thinking about tools or imperatives that could achieve 
you know, a more, or lift up a more democratic ideal. That's one I, way. I mean, there's always, a, there's always a problem with uh, fitting non-democratic organizations into a democracy. Like, this is an old issue about, you know, workplace. Uh, I always teach in my classes, I do a week where I teach Jane Addams, uh, a modern leader, do voices of the ruling of men, and Hitler's speech to the industrialists. Because they're all making the same point. Hitler says to the industrialists, you don't want a democracy. You all run your companies according to the leadership principle with a dictator. And so you can't have like a democracy. You need all of society to be run, run like that. And, uh, and Jane Addams and Du Bois are saying, well, you can't really have businesses run like this because that's not democratic. You need everything to be democratic. But the reality is, you know, when you're asked to create a structure for a business, you're often asked to create a non-democratic structure. And that's because we think of businesses not as hierarchically organized. Uh, and so with architecture, you face the problem of democracy. How do we, how do we negotiate these anti-democratic the anti-democratic ethos of, say, a church, <laughs> of a prison, of uh, a business, uh, a fa uh, with the democratic ethos of a democratic mm -hmm. society. Yeah, I would say that uh, we did have a period in architecture in the early 90s uh, and late 80s uh, that was intensely political, though not at uh, very often alternative that way, which was the deconstruction movement or deconstructive movement in architecture. Um, which directly took on this problem that you basically uh, pointed out that uh, effectively, and architects have been working with this since, once you do something, it's there, and it is inherently singular and, uh, and limits your choices for how to relate to it or interact with it or whatever. So it is, at that level, uh, uh, not open and freeing in the way that an idealized version of a possible democratic architecture would be. So Decon came up with the uh, notion of a architecture that resists all possible interpretations, that is always open. Right. And it was a sort no, of a another kind of idealization that, that was true. impossibly impossible to resolve in reality because of course once you made something it was there. But there was one aspect of it that I keep trying to bring up and I didn't even think that it had a place in this conversation until just a moment ago, which is this idea of the near figure, which is an aesthetic idea, a form that encourages reading, gives a sense of legibility, draws in and engages the uh, viewer, the ex person who is experiencing the thing, but always thwarts any kind of conclusion about what in fact it is or supposed to do or what it's suggesting that you're supposed to do or be, but it's endlessly deferring any kind of uh, certainty about its own, um, uh, ex you know, it, its its own reading, its own uh, uh, actual meaning. You know, it it, it obvious it always defers meaning. It is, as Jeff Kipnis has put it, undeci ultimately undecidable. I just want to point out that Vladislav Surkov, uh, the Putin's um, a propaganda minister, political technologist, who's a big fan of deconstruction and a big fan <laughs> of postmodernism. There's no truth, it's all open to interpretation. So it's tricky. You don't yes. want democracy to veer into, you know, uh, into, uh, you know. So what on, on, we have to We have to call it time there. On, on that note, thank you. Um, thank you for joining us. And, and please join us for a reception in Watt Hall, where we, this conversation can continue over drinks. Thank you, Jason. Thank you.